But the death and burial we mark at Easter does not follow form. The burial falls apart uh, midway, not from the erosion of an embankment by the sea, but by the one and only resurrection in history. The graves that are slipping on Gabriel are upsetting for those concerned and the details are in the sounder. The one grave that has invited and informed the lives of currently 2.2 billion people all over the world, the details are in holy writ. And they're there for us, as John says, as Luke says, to give us the facts. That's why this text has not been lost. And our story as we find ourselves in the resurrected Christ and the ascended God fold into the, into the story of scripture. So the Bible is not just God's story. It becomes my story and your story and the church's story, our story together. And, you know, this is kind of a joke, but, you know, we want to know each other and rub up against each other and uh, be uncomfortable with one, one another now as we practice for the kingdom come because we will spend eternity together. We will be resurrected together and live together and reign together. There's so much in the news right now by certain pomposities <laughs> about their reigns and their kingdoms and, and, you know, the renewing of past kingdoms, the American kingdom, the Russian kingdom, what was long before Putin, that it would rise from its ashes. And, you know, I was interested to know that in Acts, when it says barbarians and Scythians, those Scythians, not to speak against Russians, but those Scythians are the ancestors of Russians, and they were to barbarians the barbarians said, yikes, the Scythians are coming. I mean, you know, our histories are not, the Canadian history is not a good history. You know, we have our terrible flaws. And so it's also imitative of the kingdom of God, which looks forward and creates. And you, the mind boggles at what will we rule and what will we reign and what will we do in Jesus Christ? And that's part of what we begin to perceive in God. The living God draws a line in the sands of time, a line that will be articulated to every nation on earth. Will you believe in the one he has sent, the one resurrected, the back from the dead one? You know, the resurrection just flips logic by the one who had flipped the laws of gravity, had flipped the laws of cleanliness, of healing, of life and death. He saved the life of Lazarus, brought him back from the, death, from the dead. And his death and resurrection, his death and living again, he gave a hit to death. So the question for us is, you know, are we joining with him in serving his interests, empowered by his spirit, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, is at work in us, we're told. And that's our call. It's constant, it's universal, it's to all nations. And our answer brings the resurrection power to our lives. When we answer that directive to believe the one he sent, the one we call Emmanuel, God with us. And I want to ask this morning this question, and uh, which is, how is he with us? How do, we, how do we encourage ourselves every day? How do we stay in him? How is he with us? You throw out an answer to me, and then I'll correct you and give you the right answer. No, how is he with us? He's in, in our minds. He influences our minds and the way we think. That's what I actually want to talk about, our perception. He's in us with each other. He's in us in, in his kingdom, which is not always the church. We look for his kingdom 
where God reigns. We look for the relationships where God rules. We look, for, so that means forgiveness, acceptance, being beloved. You know, many of us love uh, a little baby here. We may be loving another one this morning. <laughs> Um, Adriana, and you love a baby like that because she loves you. That, that's a sign of Christ, is the love shown to us, eh? And God is like that. He doesn't want to go where he isn't known and loved. So, uh, Dallas Willard, oh, so how is he with us? This is kind of a Dallas Willard. Indescribable. It's indescribable. Thanks. It's true, Brent. It's indescribable. When we hit on it, it's like gold. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all... Why don't you sing that for us now, Brent? <laughs> Who wants destiny just to sing all morning? <laughs> With Thomas on the side. Um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. They're indescribable. You want more. You'd sell everything for that one pearl, right? Well, he's with us, uh, and we perceive him in our own minds as our mind is renewed. And this definition of a renewed mind, I like, changing what the mind is directed upon. Now, for each of us, that most often means changing my focus from the kingdom of me to the kingdom of God. I am the greatest object, uh, barrier to the kingdom of God. My own preoccupations, my own future, my own past, my own death. Fear of death is what is eliminated when we come to know the, um, the truth of God. Death goes. So why are we so... What, it's incredible, the power of the self. So we change that focus. Brother Lawrence, I'm probably mentioned him before, from the 1500s, was a clumsy man, a humble, clumsy man, and he wanted not to be so clumsy. So he, what we all would do, he went into a monastery to be corrected for his clumsiness. And he found out God didn't really care. God just thought he was great. And he, began, he wrote that little classic, Practicing the Presence of God. And it took him a while but he continued to bring his mind back to the presence of God. And he instructs us and encourages us today because of his experience with God. So um, as we give ourselves to looking at Jesus, reading, this is, we read what he did, we read the Gospels and the whole scripture to, as Aletheia teaches us, to pull that line of salvation which is through the whole scripture. And we listen to what he said and we hear it again and again because it has to correct what we say to ourselves and that's a lot of correcting for some of us we have years of listening to family to community a community's culture has a great influence on us uh, on what we think and a family's culture is right in our bones and the things we've heard from birth need need a lot of replacing and new tracks set in the brain. And we know that that happens, right? We have to set tracks. And that way, we begin to be found in the kingdom of God. That is, in our relationships with people which seem to be unbelievable, new friends that seem like old friends, old friends that don't disappear even if we're not with them in the same cities. Um, relationships with boys and girls, how we treat them, perhaps differently from w the way we were treated. All sorts, uh, men and women, and all sorts and conditions of men and women where God rules and he reigns. And we find, as we have that perception, that we like what he's doing. We like the way that is. It is unbelievable. <laughs> It is very beautiful, and we begin to like it, and we begin to like to be resident there. It takes time, it's different, but we like it. We like it better than our homes, better than our duvets, better than our IKEA 
I have a word for that. So the kingdom of God is not always where we expect to find it, but this kingdom is with us, and nothing will prevail against it. Now, uh, I want to just look briefly at, at the account of Mary, because I think in the resurrection uh, we can see good indicators of people who've been with Jesus uh, from the beginning, and they've come to understand a certain amount, but this is a sea change. You know, this is a huge apocalypse when he's resurrected, and they, even though he's told them he would die and be risen after three days, they, you know, who knows what they thought that meant. It confused them. Even though they said, you're my Lord and my God, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we just look at, at Mary. She was the first one um, who came to the tomb early in the morning it, 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 while it was still dark. And she saw the stone rolled away and she ran back to the disciples. She ran back to Peter and John. And they needed to know. And she knew that anything about the body of Jesus and where it was, like it wasn't there, they needed to know. They had that, you know, sometimes when things are very upsetting for people, they go home. They call home. They go back. And it interested me just thinking about this. None, none of them seem to have gone back to their wives or families or relatives or just, you know, to a safe place. No, they stayed together. And that's another sign of, of, of the kingdom, is the the reign of fellowship in Christ proves stronger than phoning home. So they stayed there and they figured it out because Jesus was so important to them. He had begun to form them. They saw the kingdom reigning in him. And so she knew they wanted to know. And they came Im immediately. The, dis the disciples, you know, ran. And, and they came, they saw, they ran again home. And she was left alone weeping, looking into the tomb. And there again is the connection with Jesus. This was so distressing. I'm sure I've said this before. At my father's funeral, you know, the machine didn't take the body down. And I was at that time not familiar with funeral propriety. And we left in the car. And then later in the evening, we were coming back to the grave. And I just saw the horizon. I saw no body. And my first thought, just instinct, you think this is because of me, but somebody has stolen my father's body. You know, I don't know. I just, I had no thought that it had been buried. And then everybody said, no, the machine takes it down later, which, you know, is not a great way. It's nice and the body goes down and you shovel a little on it. But... Um, it was, that second was so distressing to me. I'm not comparing it to the disciples, but they, that is so distressing that the person that they held, I mean, look how people bury heads of state or heads of religion. You know, they keep the body forever. It's entombed, it's in glass. And this king of kings was gone. So the disciples left, Mary's weeping, saw two angels, asked, it's interesting, they asked why she was weeping, and she said, you know, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where to find him. She was finding him just to serve the body, just to respect the body, to rewrap it, to, to you know, do the right thing with it, to put ointment on it, to bless it. And it was so distressing to her, and weeping, she saw Jesus. Didn't know it was Jesus. And he said, why are you weeping? And she assumed he was the gardener and asked him where he had placed Jesus. He must have something to do with it, like a grave tender, tomb tender. And Jesus was there for Mary as she was by him. As soon as he said, Mary... She knew him, not by sight. He didn't look exactly like Jesus in that spiritual resurrected body, but she recognized his voice like the sheep recognizes the voice of the shepherd. 
She knew her teacher. She knew her older brother. She knew her Lord, her Savior. And Jesus, because Jesus had been the focus of Mary's mind and perception. Everything was translated through him to her in her life. So she was tuned in to the person she knew and loved. And that's what, that's instructive for us. That isn't what this text is mainly about. It's about that we would believe, but it's instructive. She wept openly at the thought of his body being placed, misplaced. And when she mistook him for the gardener, many people say she recognized the creator of heaven and earth, the tender of the Garden of Eden. She, she knew it was a creator. And she knew he would help her find her Lord. And true to Mary and the disciples, their teacher, Jesus step by step teaches and coaches them and Mary here through the arc of death, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. She's, you know, it's like, Mary, don't cling to me. This is part of what is happening. This is not a death like another death. This is a death of God. And he's basically saying, you know, I'm not in the grave, I'm risen. So go back to the disciples and say these words. I am ascending to my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. And in this statement, Jesus invites Mary into the preferred future of life in the kingdom as sister to Jesus, daughter to his father, to live in him for his purposes and to allow him to live in her for her perfect purpose, a life that will never stop. So from Mary and just these incidents, we have a heads up about God with us. We, we will never live through those three days. The, these are marked down for us because they're astounding. And some people read this, many people, all, maybe all of us, and just you can't, you can't do anything but believe it. You have to, you know, there have been many people that have tried to uh, discredit this and they've become believers. So we have a choice and it's to focus on that life our, of God and our life with him or stay back and stay with our own life. I'm pushing 70, and I'll tell you, how's that working for you? It's just, it's just exhausted me, and I don't want to do it anymore. So to choose my own means of perception, to locate God, is a, is a great, great calling. Just, just daily to locate him. That's a choice for me to decide, and God is very respectful of our own decisions and our own agency and our own free will. He, if he's invited, I like Dallas Willard saying, it's like when we're in, not invited to a party, you're not dying to go there. You know, if you, your friend wants you to go, but you're not invited, you're not dying to go. I, I can speak about that because when I was five, my friend, Kathy Wright, was having a party. I think she was eight. And I decided to go. <laughs> Did I tell you this? Yeah, well, it wasn't. It, I spent the time with her mother, and I took one of my golden books and erased in it and gave it to her. But, uh, you know, it wasn't the greatest memory <laughs> because we want to go where we're invited, and God, the Lord is like that. Mary went at dawn, not too early for her. She's off, and we use our bodies to obey. Our bodies finally have to be obedient, to get up, to pray, to go, to listen, to listen when it's boring, to listen when it's not boring, to wait for the moment that indicates the kingdom of God is here. She looks while he may be found. And there is that scripture, seek him while he may be found. And we know about Mary because we know about Mary that morning because she was looking for Jesus. That's why. 
She was answering angels for Jesus. She was asking and finding, and she was ready to learn. She was ready to believe him. She was ready to obey him and ready to speak for him, ready to join with those who were seeking. And all of them would congregate again. The two from Emmaus would come back having encountered him and been stirred up spiritually. They came back and they were all there when he came, by, John, by John's account, I think, into the uh, upper room. They were all there. And then when Thomas wasn't there, he came right again and showed to Thomas, taught Thomas what he needed to know. And he teaches us what we need to know. He's with us as we draw near to him, as we look for him, as we seek out who he was on earth, what happened to him, his resurrection which takes us from glory to glory to our own resurrection and future, a secured future sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we realize how he is with us more and more fully. Bless you as you, as you and I, bless us all as we do that individually and together. I'm going to leave you with, or finish with, this exhortation from Pedro Arupe, um, something written in the, he died at the, in the 90s, I think. Nothing is more practical than finding God, that is, than falling in love in a quite absolute, final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you will do with your evenings, how you will spend your weekends, what you read, what you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and this will decide everything. Amen. Maybe we'll pray and then we'll pray again. Lord, we thank you for this unbelievable truth that you have given death its final hit and we live without its terror and even though we see so many um, so many machines built to kill and used to kill we know that uh, nothing can kill our life in you and we thank you for that and we pray that we would be those who are finding you, seeing you, perceiving you in all the circumstances of our lives and in our relationships and in ourselves, that we would be found in you. We thank you, Lord, for the knowledge of your truth And we thank you for the world to come that you have started in us here. In Jesus' name we pray.